We all live in a digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust and to be trusted. We all despise control and desire freedom. We, we are all, all united. united. I would like to Hello. thank you everyone for attending for our panel organized by Council for Dialogue with Young Generation uh, in times of conference IGF 2021 in Katowice. Today we'll talk about gaming and esports as new economic branch of an industry 4.0. Today with me we'll talk about this with Michał Kudliński, Polsat Games. Hello. Julian Żelaznowski, Chancellor of Prime Minister of Poland. Hello, everyone. Maciej Opielski, XCOM Ago Esport. I hope we already connected by via Zoom. And with Michał Białek from Wykop.pl. Uh, excuse me, do this microphone works? Looks like One, yes. One, two, three. So Good morning. It works? Yeah, yeah, we can. Oh, okay. That's, that's, that's great. That's great. At the beginning, I would like to ask our guests every one of you are you would you describe yourself as a gamer if yes please raise your hand how many gamers we got already here okay so good crowd nobody would say that esport is not a sport i hope so and also i've got the same question for you uh, are you d would you describe yourself as a gamer and if yes what kind of uh, games do you like to play the most are those pc console games maybe you are those horrible mobile games players or just the board games please miho can you start uh, i usually differentiate uh, gaming between esports uh, because i was never really into gaming. When I was young, I did not spend a lot of time with computer games. Uh, they did not attract me enough. But uh, after I discovered online gaming, where you can compete against real people, the satisfaction the victory brings, uh, or a good defeat within a good match, uh, was uh, something I was uh, really attracted to. And I spent a lot of my young years playing online games. And that's the games I am interested in. And that's why it, uh, my, uh, my profession is esports comment commentator, to uh, still be in touch with people who are really great uh, in esports titles. Mr. Zelaznowski, same question for you. Are you a gamer? Uh, thank you for having me, Maciej. Um, shortly said, yes, I used to play a lot. Uh, League of Legends, Quake, uh, Unreal Tournament. Uh, Half-Life, uh, League of Legends also, and of course Counter-Strike. We got the same questions for our online guests. Uh, Mr. Białek, can you answer it? Uh, hello, good morning everyone. I don't know, what do you, what do you hear me? Well, we can hear you. Oh, great. Good morning again. So I used to play a lot, uh, especially economic strategy games. Unfortunately, they are not so popular right now. And I also don't have so much time. So what I'm doing right now, I'm just playing casual arcade games, just like five minutes around the, or after the meetings. So this is what I'm doing. Thank you very much. And Mr. Opielski. Oh, hello, welcome. Uh, for me, it's pretty much the same as, as for uh, Mr. Kulinski. I started playing uh, games, but like playing uh, offline games and playing single players mode wasn't for me. Uh, when I discovered I can compete with people uh, online uh, and actually prove myself how good I am, uh, that was the moment I, I started loving gaming and esports. It's great. Uh, it's great that all of us actually are in touch with games, with gaming, with esports. It's a pleasure to talk with. Okay. Uh, give us a second. Sorry. Uh, it's a pleasure to talk with such a great uh, with such a great people. And my first question would be addressed to Mr. Opielski and Mr. Kudlinski. Um, I, I got a question that is it difficult for new investors uh, to enter the esport market uh, with a new team or maybe with a new tournament? Is the market already full, or this is there a place for for new players? Mr. Kudlinski, can you start? Uh, of course. Um, if we focus on esports. 
uh, not gaming in a broader sense. And if we take the question in a general sense, is it easy to make use out of money you've put in a newly created project uh, in esports? I'd say it's quite a task. It's a quite a challenge. It's uh, not easy. It's getting easier every year, but it's difficult right now, in my opinion. And I try to name a few reasons for that. Uh, firstly, esports is such a young and fresh uh, industry and phenomena that is yet to be regulated by governments or law, yet to be formalized, yet to develop its own universal structures within esports, within business side of it, and. Uh, it, it will take time uh, uh, before it happens. Uh, another thing is there is a big difference between sports and esports. In sports, you have teams, league, you have federations, but no one actually owns the sports discipline itself uh, in a literal sense. In a literal sense, no one uh, owns the football, but in esports, it's the very thing. The game developer creates a game, it becomes an esports. And the game developer has full autonomy within this field, both the esports and the business side of it. So when you are running a project within those esports, you have to take into an account the developer decision. You have to adapt, and this, those decisions are often capricious. Uh, let's uh, let's say you run a series of tournaments or a league, and suddenly the game developer does not prolong the license for it. You are not granted it. You you cannot uh, uh, run your tournaments anymore, and your project in some way fails. Or you have uh, you've invested a lot of money in a successful team of players that are good in a current version of the game, but the current uh, means a lot because in sports, the rules, the major rules, are not shifting a lot. Uh, the sport discipline stays the same uh, for a most of time, uh, but in esports, the game changes in every month, in a rapid speed. Uh, that's crazy, but your team can go from hero to zero in a spark of a moment, and uh, you can waste a lot of money by that. So there are also other examples of that. Let's not got in, go into that. And also there are small, I would say, uh, esports HR crisis, uh, because you need to run a project by a really grown up and mature person who knows uh, the business side, the marketing side of running a project, and also this person is required to understand esports, understand its culture, understand how niche it is. And it's hard to find a proper uh, person who then can take from both of the worlds. Uh, it's really hard, but it's a necessity. And uh, also the esport itself is really niche. It's uh, deeply rooted in a culture of very young people. An average age of a traditional sport viewer is around 42, 43, depending on the sport discipline. For an esport discipline, it's 22, 23, nearly cut in a half. Are you sure your project you've invested in uh, understand uh, this young people culture, sense of humor? Is it attractive for that? Um, of course, uh, nowadays everyone starts to learn the internet culture, esports culture, but it takes time, takes an effort. And um, you see the picture I, I tried to draw. Um, it's hard to go long term into esports. It's quite a risk. And yet, and that's a big esports paradox, you need to go long term. I cannot actually imagine short, uh, short term profits in esports. You have to put a lot of money, invest a lot of money. There are big costs to develop a structure, good project, hire a proper man, and maybe, maybe in a few years, your product will be attractive for enough young people that they will bring you sponsor, that will you bring you profits, some returns in a few years span. But it not always happens. Uh, Esports industry is wild. It's a base to be tamed and it's often a sunk cost. So I'm an optimist for the future, but right now I understand why sponsors are distancing uh, uh, themselves from uh, esports. It's a quite a risk, quite a challenge. Thank you very much for this answer. And Mr. Opielski, what's your view on this topic? Are you afraid of competition for your organization or maybe you feel settled and safe without any fear of this? Well, I will focus more on the on the organization point of view. Uh, investment is always welcome. Like We always want new investors, but uh, 
mainly the, the decision to enter a new title depends on the uh, on as mr kodlinski said on the developer uh, if the rights to the tournaments are open if the rights to the uh, esports ecosystem are open because you can imagine that you would invest like let's say one million dollars for the talk here in a esports team uh, in a specific title because you know like the ecosystem is open you can um, qualify for each tournament even for the uh, for the world world championship uh, because everybody has a chance and you invested that that amount of money and suddenly the the developer decides okay we we the, the previous model we had was was pretty good, but now we want to focus on a, more on a monetizing our system. And we do a franchise system. You know, you, you have to buy a slot in our uh, in our cycle of tournaments. Or if if you're not part of the of the franchise system, you won't be able to be a part of the World Cup uh, finalist team. And that's the that's the reason I think like for new investors it depends on the developer of the developer of the game which which title you would like to enter. Uh, you still have a quite a lot of games that the the rights of the ecosystem are open. So uh, like we have a, a, a CS:GO like Counter Strike Global Offensive like Fortnite uh, and many many more games that we can just find new new players. Uh, and try to develop them as a as a professional athletes and and be be part or participate the the most uh, the most stacked tournaments that they are. But yeah, for for us as a uh, as a esports organization, it's it's always like a, quite a task. Uh, first of all, to to stay at the level because as as uh, Mr. Kodinsky said, the games are changing. It's not like uh, we have one path or one patch on on a certain game each year uh, for each of legends i think it's even one patch if month or even uh, even faster uh, in counter strike or fortnite or any other games there are like at least 10 maybe 5 10 to 10 patches uh, changing completely the game like for for the meta for like uh, mr Kony said from zero from hero to zero those players will will feel comfortable in this specific meta of the game and uh, if the game the meta changes they won't feel comfortable so you need to develop the players and the same goes for the organization in this in this year or previous year that was uh, the the system that was working for the organization and the content they were creating was funny the next year it could change you need to develop also the organization so i would say like the the market is still open but it requires first of the long-term solutions you need to see your investments are long term you won't get profit in one year on two years it doesn't even depend on how much money you will invest it will be 500k or 10 million dollars it doesn't matter but you need to see a, a bigger picture and a, and a definitely longer way to get profit uh, from from working in an organization an esport organization Thank you for this suggestion. I think I will try to make some investments. And of course, for you, don't be afraid to start new teams, to start new organizations. As as I heard and as we heard, uh, it's th there is a still place for for new players in the in this in this case. The next question I will address to Mr. Zelaznowski and Mr. Kulinski, and it's gonna be about maybe some sort of collaboration uh, of government and the gaming industry. Uh, does eSport and gaming industry have a chance to support the government in promoting Poland and promoting international um, initiatives? I mean, first of all, success of WeChat, which are serious, and maybe tournaments that were designed for, for, for example, uh, for for future sports festival which was designed for uh, teams from countries of the Visegrad group so mr zelaznowski how you see this topic okay so uh, first thing, maybe i will make some remark about um, the whole industry so the globally um, gaming industry generates about 175 billion dollars revenues so it's amount to the gdp of uh, ukraine or greece so uh, it's really a huge area to uh, to address your business. And secondly, almost half of the world um, civilization is uh, are the players. So 2.9 billion uh, players all, all around the world. So you can imagine how huge amount of people you have to address or ideas, values, or some communicates that we we want to persuade them uh, to. 
Um, and to, to answer your question, uh, the WeChat is a really good example of, um, of how we could make some successes internationally, but secondly, how, how one success is not enough. Uh, so um, uh, I have uh, encountered so, some of the uh, newspapers all around the world um, titles after the Netflix series, uh, and it was um, estimated as a huge success, uh, was released, and after the Witcher 3 was also released. So um, there were few kind of uh, few kind of thoughts first was about the books so Andrzej Sapkowski books top amazons and google books sales list and were 13 new york times bestsellers second was about the game that Witcher third won the first place on global top sellers on steam third was about the series so the netflix platform had a record viewing weekend and it sounds really impressive isn't it but we are 3 years uh, after those events uh, and uh, now I take a look about the rankings of the most viewed series. Mm, two years ago it was the, the Witcher, but now if you take a look at this list, first is Squid Games, 1.6 billion views. Second is the Bridgerton, I don't even know this series, 675 uh, million views. Mm, and uh, Witcher is just at the fifth place. Uh, with 500 million views. So uh, the, uh, the idea that, uh, that I want to say that is you can't stand on one leg because uh, I believe that The Witcher promotes Polish culture much more than uh, the Squid Games promotes the Korean one. If, you, uh, if you've seen the series, you know what I mean. Uh, but we, uh, we need much more of those successes. Uh, second thought uh, that comes to my mind uh, if uh, it's uh, that a fantasy are a really great tool for promoting some some ideas and uh, uh, many countries uh, do their uh, culture and uh, historic and um, politics based on the movies series and games and uh, probably the United States are uh, the best in that. So you can see a lot of super production uh, that uh, that are about some uh, United States uh, United States uh, successes. And um, uh, you know uh, when you when we when we look uh, when we look at the, um, uh, our history and uh, I mean history of Poland uh, and our movies, they are mainly about. Uh, some um, like different different scale of of successes, mm, and third um, third uh, thing is that uh, the Witcher promotes the heroes that is unperfect, the hero that uh, makes some mistakes, mm, uh, and uh, I believe that uh, if we if we could say what our culture can give to uh, to the world. Uh, is this imperfection in, in, in being a hero. Mm, uh, and I wonder that, uh, uh, that it's, it's the way that people see themselves in, in being imperfect uh, more than just uh, uh, being this, uh, being this amazing uh, United States heroes. Thank you very much. And Mr. Opielski, would you encourage your team to participate in a tournament that would promote some uh, multi-government uh, summit or, or something something similar to this? Yes, of course. Like we were be, because we started with the V4 future tournament. Uh, we had the uh, we had the possibility to be to be part of that tournament this year because we we advanced there as a Polish national uh, esports team. It's like for us, it's always a, a great pleasure to to promote uh, our country uh, abroad, right? And definitely on tournaments that are that are taking place abroad. Uh, we a few years ago there there was a cycle of tournaments where um, only only players for certain countries could participate in a in a, in a tournament. Something like we have. Uh, world championship in football right now so you need to have the the certain passport of the country to be to be part of the team and and the nationalities like play versus themselves to 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 find the the one uh, and the, the winner and that's something i think we are missing but if we, if we could do something like a tournament like that that uh, will be also a great great opportunity to promote 
certain country if the uh, with the help of its government uh, to show all not only the esports side of of the certain country but also like everything uh, that is good and around that country right that's that that's what i'm thinking Thank you very much. Uh, we talk about some advantages of esports uh, industry and the gaming industry, but I would like to talk also about the disadvantages because uh, entertainment has never been so accessible um, and also so addictive. We got really easy connection to Netflix, to Twitch, to everything uh, in within a second. Uh, but some players become addicted to drugs, such as uh, Ritalin or Adderall, who helps them uh, improve their skills and so on and so on. And also this entertainment, this video game entertainment, um, it's, it's interacts direct directly with our brain and dopamine production. Um, is this a problem that gaming industry should address or maybe a public sector? How do you view this issue? And with this question, I would like to start with Mr. Bialek. Good morning again, and thank you very much for this question. We are, we are just talking about the booming industry of gaming, but uh, sometimes we are just not talking about the, the shadows. And this is one of the, one of the shadows that uh, there's a lot of people that have, that have problems. Probably when we started today, then we just, the first thing we did was checking our phone, checking the Instagram, checking Facebook and seeing, seeing beautiful people, young, successful. And then uh, people start to ask themselves a question, why they are there, why we are not there. And this is, uh, and this is a huge problem. Uh, all of us need some kind of attention, some kind of to, to, to be noticed. And uh, they, people start to think what they can do to, to make it to, to be there on the same position. So they start to play with uh, with get, with drugs, and this is one of the options. If they are no still not there, they try to somehow appear on the market. This is a hate speech because we we shouldn't say only about the uh, gaming. It's called the digital world, especially after uh, lockdown in the COVID times, where the digital is really really important. So I run a social media site and uh, probably once a week we contact the police because we see that in the comments there is someone that is say about, says about uh, making a suicide. And this is a huge problem that just, just arise. And of course we are contacting the police, we are sending the details uh, of, of that young guy, he or she. But uh, honestly, I'm in the business for 20 years and I don't see any institution that is taking care about those that do not follow. And I truly believe that this is a important issue, especially in the public sector, because I believe that only they can help. I mean, there's maybe there should be some kind of a topic in schools, how to fight with the hate speech, how to fight with the uh, gaming addiction. So I truly believe that there should be some program in the public sector to, to help with it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I mentioned the public, the public sector, how this this topic applies to the public sector, and we have a representative of it. Please, Mr. Zelaznowski, answer my question. How should should gaming industry deal with this problem? Maybe public sector, or maybe you see this not a problem at all. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm not an expert on mental health, uh, but I don't uh, believe that um, government should so somehow um, regulate this market. For example, if you can see at the China and they're limited uh, the, the playing for, for childs for about three hours a week, if I'm not wrong, uh, this thing couldn't work uh, in Western civilization as freedom is uh, one of our basic values. Uh, and if uh, government could, uh, would actually um, uh, limit the, uh, the hours of games that uh, young people play, uh, another uh, next day you could see or I, b I believe every citizen playing a game. So uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's, not the, it's not a recipe for that. Mm, and uh, what I can see uh, instead uh, is that we are going to uh, absolutely different direction. So uh, we can see games uh, among uh, the uh, canon of lectures 
among the uh, the obligated books that you you books. Uh, it used to be books, but now there are books and games uh, that uh, that you you can um, play to to pass your uh, exams. Uh, first uh, first time in the uh, world history we could see esports at the Olympic Games. So we we could see e Olympics. So. Uh, I believe that uh, words uh, around the world uh, trying to uh, really uh, appreciate the gaming culture, not not limited. Mandatory games in school, I think it's gonna be great, great idea. And I'm also kind of afraid that's gonna be a huge argument which the games should be mandatory, which are the legacy of gaming, and which you cannot just uh, just forget about. The next question I will address to Mr. Opielski because. The esports and the production of new games drive many different segments of economy. Uh, professional sports have series of the gadgets, shirts, clothes, accessories, etc., etc. But are the expansion opportunity for esports and the gaming industry uh, are are ended? Is this is market full, or is this still a place uh, for new, not only teams and organization, but new branches of? Uh, legacy industry, uh, past the industry that gaming can go into and promote their products with their brands, with the names, etc. Mr. Opielski, please answer for this. So, first of all, I think there, for if it's go, going for esports or gaming, there is always plenty of space uh, on everything. Uh, either it's no investments or no kind of promotion. We can see, like, I, I prepared myself with with few collaboration and few topics uh, that. First of all, it's, it doesn't care if you're like esports organization or you're a game developer. The, the last year showed us that uh, you had uh, collaboration, a uh, game uh, Fortnite with the NABL or NHL uh, as a promoting uh, promoting way to to like show show those young players that there there is not like there is something else other than gaming so they promoted uh, those specific games the fortnite also showed uh, a collaboration with marvel so they could they impress their uh, themselves with the with games uh, games collaboration with movie theaters or movie movies uh, specifically and what did organizations esports organization they did pretty much the same they they search on a market for, for they search market for a certain culture like uh, like I said before, Marvel or DC or movies like Batman, and they start uh, promoting both both marks, you know, both the organization and the and the company that they're collaborating with, uh, and showing that they can work with each other and get at the, get uh, they both gain from the cooperation uh, in that sense. And I would like to ask you to prepare some questions because I've got my last question and I want to give the microphone to you. The microphone is in the middle, so so please prepare for it. And my last question, I would never think that a China domestic policy would be involved in uh, talk about gaming, but here it is. Uh, Mr. Biawek, please, because the government of People's Republic of China has radically re restricted the possibility of playing uh, for teenagers and kids. As Mr. Zelaznowski said, it's, uh, it is three hours per week. How do you view this type of restriction? My point of view is a really tricky question because our business uh, relies on the average time the user spends in the in the internet. So then, of course, I mean this is the, the, the first rule about it, and uh, this is really important because we all think that this is all about the mental and physical uh, problems that, that, that the games is, games is doing. And uh, just to, just to start the talk, I think what we need to know is that the average time spent on gaming in China is more than twelve hours, while in states is around eight. And uh, another stat that is also important is that the number of young players below the age of 18 in China is 110 million. And just, it's just a number, but when we just see it as a number comparing to the population of Poland, which is 38 million, then we see that this is a huge, huge problem that the government, the Chinese government has to deal with. 
And uh, we all think that this is the uh, physical and mental issue, but I also want to you pay your attention that this is not only, in my opinion, it's not only about it. I mean, games are also the values. They are promoting some kind of a values. And I truly believe that the values that are promoted, they are not the values that the Communist Party uh, relies on. This is the this is the huge problem. I mean, when we see the the media in China, we see that those pop idols, the gaming idols, they are just saying that their, their skin is too soft, that the 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 males are too feminine, and this is the and this is the huge problem, which I believe that China is trying to deal with. They are trying just to block the market so that to to protect their values, so that you're not going to be an American in China in this way. Do we have any at bottom to, to this? OK, maybe Mr. Gulinski? I, I, I may add one remark that it's uh, useful, in my opinion, to differentiate mo modes of playing you can have, especially when we are talking about kids. Uh, let's say one mode is this, uh, let's uh, call it, uh, let's name it passive one. When you are just, I would even say wasting your time because you are so addicted. You are just uh, playing and playing without any goal or task for yourself. And you could be like a, a passive recipient of uh, chemical dopamine, let's say, uh, to, um, to mention the previous question. And uh, that's a mode one, which I assume worries some uh, governmental uh, organizations, like, for example, this in China. And we can compare it to mode two, which, uh, which you cannot uh, discard, because mode two is the active one. And it gets a lot of uh, bigger and bigger attention uh, in younger players. When we have online gaming, uh, where there is a competition between players, and when the, in the mode one, it's all about relaxing yourself, just having a little fun. In mode two, there are a lot of young people actually playing really competitive, hard games, which are not really fun. That's I think there is a, um, some truth in a popular joke that the most popular word uh, uh, online game, League of Legends, it's not a fun. It's a it's a job. It's it's, it's really um, it will tire you. It will uh, deprive you of your uh, emotion uh, uh, during a great great session of gaming. And I think it's worth emphasizing that the mode two promotes being active, uh, developing yourself, setting yourself a goal, and try harding. That's uh, really important. That maybe it's even something an educational system can learn from gaming. That how games made young people try it over and over to overcome uh, the challenges, overcome themselves, to grind for a better item, for a better rank, to um, uh, make higher win ratio, to be better. It uh, creates some values, it creates some hard work and being tough in a positive sense. So uh, I think it's important to governments to act to eventually target maybe the mode one, which is the passive one, and see if the mode two could be useful for actually role modeling how we can actively spend our time and develop with self how we can uh, because for example sports we are looking at the mode two we are thinking uh, doing sports is not a waste of time it's developing a character of a sportsman and i think there are parts of gaming of those uh, of this uh, second mode that actually promotes uh, the same values as the sport yeah, developing a discipline, the hard working environment that can be used not only for esport but for every every way of, of life. And uh, in the meantime, do we have any questions? Every anybody wants to ask about something? I highly encourage you for this. Okay. So thank you very much for this talk. Uh, our guests were today Michał Kudliński from Polsat Games. Thank you. Julian Żelaznowski from Council of Prime Minister of Poland. Thank you. Michał Białek from Wykop.pl. Thank you very much. And Maciej Opielski from XCOM Ago eSport. Thank you very much. I would like to thank in the name of Council for Dialogue with Young Generation to make this, this talk happen. And, for, and I would like to thank on behalf of Regional Center of International Debate in Katowice and Cluster of Social Innovation who were partners of this, this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.